Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and today we're going to be talking about how plants respond to their environment. So plants are different from animals in that they really can't move, right? They're rooted to the ground, and so whatever environment they're in, they kind of have to deal with. So whether that environment is cold or snowy or shady or whatever the case may be, they're an unlucky seed that sprouted on the side of a cliff, they need to be able to cope with the environment that they happen to be in and um, adapt to it in that local space. So because plants can't move, their, their uh, ability to react to their environment is somewhat limited, So there's, but there's some things that a plant can still do. So they have, can have a more uh, long-term response, so changes in how they grow, basically, um, and in the direction that they grow, or the speed that they grow. Um, and also there's some short-term responses they can have. So they can change the turgor pressure in different cells or change the nutrient distribution between cells, things like that that will allow them to respond to the environment that they're in. So we're going to look at a few of these different things. So one of the more, most important things that plants need is that they need light. And uh, so think about why a plant might need light. Hopefully you are thinking that they are a photoautotroph. That means that they use light energy in order to make their own carbon-based food. Um, so they need that light to make their food and it's really, really important for their survival. So um, plants do respond to light very strongly, um, particularly when they're young. So if you take a newly sprouting seed, um, that the seed contains a lot of nutrition for the developing embryo. Um, that's going to be contained within the endosperm. Hopefully you remember that from the, the reproduction lecture. And so those seeds will be sprouting, but as they sprout and they get their first few leaves out, they need to get those leaves into sunlight so that they can make food to support the plant. There's only so much food in the seed. So they need to get their, their leaves into sunlight before they run out of food in the seed. So uh, a plant that sprouts up its leaves and the leaves are immediately in sunlight, it's going to start growing broad leaves to collect a lot of light energy so they can make a lot of food. But if the plant gets its leaves up above ground and there's no light there, there's no point in making broad leaves because you can't photosynthesize. So instead, the plant invests all of its energy into continuing to grow as far as it can before it starves to try and find some light. So if you look at this picture at the top here, those are uh, radish seedlings, two different types, two different radish seedlings. They're exactly the same, except the one on the left has been exposed to light, so it invested its energy in growing broad leaves. And the one on the right didn't have any light, and so it invested all of its energy into growing really long stems in hopes of reaching some light before it starves to death. That plant is probably not going to do very well because it, it has now invested all of its energy in growth and in elongating those stems. It doesn't have a lot of energy left to make leaves, okay? Um, so that's one response you can have to life, light. Um, if there is light but it's brighter in one direction than another, one way that a plant can kind of grow into that light is through what's called phototropism. And phototropism is when a shoot bends towards the light, okay? Um, and the way that a shoot actually physically bends is that um, cell division, of course, is taking place at the, at the apical meristem, at the tip of the plant, and then um, after that, the new cells are formed, they go into the zone of elongation, and the way you, a, pa a plant can bend in one direction or another is by having cells on one side of the plant elongate more than the others. So if, a, if the side away from the light elongates more, then that plant will bend towards that light. Okay? That makes sense? Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that only the blue wavelength will trigger that bending, and that it's actually the tip of the shoot that can determine where the light is coming from. This is data from an experiment where they tried to determine what part of the plant could detect light. Um, and so they tried putting a light proof cap on the tip of the stem, and when they did that, the stem did not bend towards the light. Um, but the problem with doing that is maybe having a cap on the tip of the stem is a problem. So then they did a transparent cap on the tip of the stem, and when the light was able to pass through, then the shoot did bend. And then they were worried, okay, well, maybe it's the whole, you need to have light everywhere on the shoot in order for it to bend. So they put a light-proof sheath halfway down the stem, and it still bent. So that means that it has to have light at the tip of the stem in order to do this bending behavior, okay? So that's phototropism. Um, <clears throat> plants also respond to gravity. 
Of course, if you are a germinating seed, it's very important that your leaves go up and your roots go down. And so growth in the direction or either towards or away from gravity is called gravitropism. Um, so if you grow, are growing away from gravity, that is a negative gravitropism. If you are growing towards gravity, that's a positive gravitropism. So shoots have negative gravitropism and roots have positive gravitropism. Um, and you might see this if you've ever had a house plant that got knocked over by like your cat or something. Um, and then you notice that the shoot immediately bends and starts to grow upwards. That's an example of gravitropism. Also, you see this a lot around here on steep slopes where there's a lot of snow. You Young trees will actually get pushed over by the snow as it slides down the slope, and then the tree will actually bend. So you'll see a bend at the bottom of the tree where it's been pushed down, but then it, it turned. It, it practiced negative gravitropism to grow back upwards. Um, and it's really important. So all seeds have this ability to orient, regardless of how they fall in the soil, because they might fall right side up or they might fall right side down, upside down, and they have to be able to have their shoots go up and their roots go down. So you, you're able to see that, that that is always the case. Now, unlike phototropism, the root is a, a, the root tip is actually what is able to detect the the force of gravity. Um, and particularly if you look at the cells in the root cap. Um, there are these structures within the cell, cell called statoliths, and the statoliths are heavy, and they settle to the bottom of the cell. And so if the, if the root gets tipped sideways, those statoliths are going to settle to the side of the cell, and that's going to be what causes that root growth to change and to curve towards. And just like the, uh, the shoot tip, it's, it's, it's a difference in the elongation of the cells in the root that causes the bend in the root. Okay. Um, plants can also respond to touch. This can be really important for climbing plants. Um, growth in response to touch is called thigmotropism. If you grow towards the thing that's touching you, that would be positive thigmotropism. If you grow away from the thing that's touching you, that's negative thigmotropism. So tendrils of vines will often wrap around something that they're touching. So they're growing towards that thing so they can wrap around it. And then uh, plants that are exposed to mechanical stress like wind all the time often will grow away from it. So this tree here is experiencing wind always from one direction and it actually has grown to kind of lean away from the wind which makes it more aerodynamic and less susceptible to the pressures of that wind. Okay, so that's thigmotropism. All of these different tropisms are referring to growth either towards or the direct away from a stimulus. Okay. Um, there's also responses that plants can have that are not growth. So for example, um, there is a response called thigmonesty, or if you want to remember it as thigmonasty, that's fine too. Um, that is a very short-term response. Uh, thigmo means touch, so same, same as thigmotropism. This is something that's responding to touch. But in this case, instead of a growth, what it is is a change in turgor pressure in the leaves. So um, this plant that I have pictured here is what's called a sensitive plant. Uh, when they are touched, they will actually fold up. And um, the reason that they do this is because they actually have thorns on the underside of the leaves. And by folding up, they expose those thorns. So this helps to prevent them from being eaten by herbivores, protects them from herbivores. So it's kind of a cool response in that way. Um, and the way they do it is actually by actively pumping um, uh, ions from one cell to another. And so when you pump ions from one cell to another, you're uh, the, in the cells where you are um, pumping the ions out of, there's now less dissolved stuff because you've removed all these ions. Um, and so if there's less dissolved stuff, that means there's more water. And in the cells where you just pump the ions into, there's now more dissolved stuff, which means there's less water. So you have osmosis. Remember, osmosis is a diffusion of water down a concentration gradient. And so there's higher concentration in, in the cells that the, the ions were just pumped out of, lower concentration of water in the cells that the ions were pumped into. And so you'll have a, a diffusion of water across. And so what that does is it reduces turgor pressure in some of the cells within the leaf, and that's what causes the cells to fold, fold up. So I wanted to show you guys a video of this actually happening. So hold on just a second. So this is a sensitive plant, and as you can see, when the, this person touches the plant, the leaves slowly fold up. So the, it receives a stimulus of being touched, and then it moves those ions across the cell membrane, changes the osmotic pressure, and the leaves fold up, which is pretty cool. 
Okay, so the plants have these different responses and how are they controlled? How does the plant actually manipulate these growth patterns uh, and, and such? And, and plants actually have hormones, same as animals have hormones. And so hormones are, um, are chemicals, they're molecules uh, that send signals from one part of an organism to another. All right, um, so we have hormones like testosterone and corticosterone, things like that. Uh, plants also have hormones as well, but they're different than the animal hormones. Um, there's a bunch of different plant hormones you can read about in, in the book. Um, I'm gonna talk about three here, auxins, gibberellins, and ethylene, all right? So auxins are really important for plant growth. Um, generally, they are produced in the apical meristem, uh, among other places, um, and they, they regulate growth and they regulate, um, in particular, they regulate cell elongation. So if you take a, a tip of a shoot and you cut it off and you put it on a piece of auger, you can actually absorb the auxins from that, that um, shoot tip. And then if you take a little bit of that auger that has the auxins in it and you put it on one side of the stem, what you see is that this, the, um, the cells that are exposed to the auxin elongate more than the cells that are not exposed to the auxin. So that bending, what does that look like? Hopefully you just remembered we talked about phototropism and gravitropism. That looks like that bending, right? And so that's what actually controls the bending of uh, it, that occurs in phototropism and in gravitropism is exposure to auxin. So when the plant is receiving that light from only one side, it produces auxin on the opposite side and that causes the stem to grow in that direction, okay? So auxins are important for, for that purpose. Um, auxins also suppress cell division in the axial buds. So if you have your terminal bud, um, there's auxin that's being produced in the terminal bud, in the apical meristem in the terminal bud, and that auxin is going to go down the shoot and it's gonna suppress growth in your axial buds. So if you cut off the tip of the plant, the, uh, the, the, um, the apical meristem of the plant, then that auxin is no longer being produced and that releases uh, the axial buds to undergo cell division and to grow new new shoot extensions. So this little experiment here, if you cut the tip off and you don't put any auxin on there, you'll see that those axial buds will grow. If you cut the tip off and then you add auxin to the top, so you're basically replacing the auxin that would have been produced by the apical meristem, then those axial buds remain suppressed and they don't grow. Okay, so auxin is definitely affecting that as well. Um, gibberellins are largely responsible for extending the internode length. Um, so remember, shoots have these uh, repeating phytomers, and so you have a node and then an, an internode length and then another node and then an internode length. Um, an increase in gibberellin will increase that internode length, so it'll increase uh, cell elongation with, in between the nodes. Um, and so, for example, in this pea plant here, that makes the, the shoot taller. You can see there's the same number of leaves on both of these shoots, but one of them is taller than the other. Um, gibberellin is used in the production of commercial grapes. Um, they expose the blossoms of the grape to gibberellin, um, and what that does is it makes the blossoms grow long, have longer spaces between each flower, and if there's longer spaces between each flower, then you have more room between each flower for a grape to form, and so it, 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 uh, it creates larger grapes that are prettier and more attractive to human consumption. So that's a very common practice in the production of grapes. <clears throat> Uh, one more hormone that I want to talk about is ethylene. Ethylene, uh, among other things, is responsible for the ripening of fruit. Um, and uh, one thing, one story that I think is kind of cool is that um, tomatoes are a very popular fruit that people like to eat, as you may know. And um, normally, tomatoes growing on the plant will um, become start to become ripe and they'll produce ethylene and that'll cause the fruit to ripen and you'll have these nice red ripe tomatoes that are delicious like a garden grown tomato is the best thing in the world right um, but when they ripen on the plant they are soft and they're hard to transport and they get spoiled before they get to market so uh, tomatoes commercial tomatoes have been genetically modified uh, to put in a copy of the ethylene the gene that makes ethylene that is in the reverse direction. So when the RNA gets 
uh, translated out of there basically binds and so that pre prevents the production of the proteins that would create the ethylene. So you can't, these plants can't make ethylene basically is the upshot. So it's genetically modified these plants so they cannot make ethylene. What that means is that the fruits can't ripen. So they stay green on the plant, they pluck them, and then ethylene is actually a gas. Um, it's, uh, it's a very small molecule that, that can be a gas very easily. Um, it's produced by a lot of ripening fruits. In fact, if you have a fruit that you want to ripen, you can put it in a paper bag with a banana. Bananas are like ethylene machines. They pump out a ton of ethylene. So you put it in a bag with banana and roll down the top. That banana will pump out a bunch of ethylene and it'll cause your other fruit in that bag to ripen, which is kind of cool. Anyway, they, they bring these green tomatoes. They get them to market to where they're supposed to be. Because they're green, they're still hard. They haven't gotten soft, so they transport better. They don't get bruised and beat up. And then when they get them to market, they pump them, they pump into the chamber where the tomatoes are. They pump ethylene in there. And that ripens up the tomatoes. It turns them red and they can put them out on the store shelves, but they taste like crud, right? Because store-bought tomatoes just do not have the same flavor as homegrown tomatoes, and it's kind of a shame. All right, that's my story about plant reactions. I will see you next time.